we're continuing the session on quantum information uh, and gravity and unification. And we have three speakers. Uh, one of them is going to be online, uh, but we're going to start with a talk by uh, Stefano Cordardi, Cordardi uh, on the origin of physical information. And in particular, the question is quantum entanglement a way to conserve information? So please go ahead. Hello, hi everybody. Thank you, Eric, for uh, the nice introduction. Um, I'm Stefano Gottardi, and uh, uh, actually I'm lead physicist in a, a startup company in Eindhoven. Uh, Symbiont is a spin-off from Philips. Uh, but today, uh, there we do simulation software, advanced simulation software, but uh, I will not talk, as you can imagine, about what I do at Symbiont, but I will talk about uh, some ideas that I developed during uh, sabbatical period after my PhD. And I would like to, uh, now you had a very nice lunch, you can relax. I would like to take you to a nice journey. Uh, the journey I did there to, in Asia uh, where I work on this. So you, you can think you are on a nice island in the Philippines. And uh, I challenge you to now think uh, from a bottom-up approach and uh, think you are the architect of the information universe. So put aside everything you learned in academia uh, especially uh, the definitions, so the many definitions you might uh, have in mind about information. And uh, let's try to think uh, from the uh, architect of the universe. Uh, and if we want to try to make our baby universe, how, which kind of information uh, we would use and how that would work. And that's some question I asked myself uh, more or less like 10 years ago. And I would like to uh, take you through this journey. So please, especially put aside Shannon entropy information and uh, meaning inside information. Uh, and then uh, you just put it aside and try to understand it from this new perspective. So uh, to help you further with uh, this journey, uh, here I start already with my key takeaways. Um, first of all, if we want to uh, try to go beyond uh, the current understanding in quantum mechanics to try to go a level deeper and really understand how uh, physics can emerge from physical information. Um, we should uh, start to account uh, much better of the type, the kind of information we put inside wave functions. So again, put aside epistemic wave functions so that uh, are subjective knowledge of the physical system, but try uh, uh, to attempt to think in terms of ontological wave functions. So wave function that must contain all the information that the information universe needs to, uh, to have to be able to compute the reality. And the second thing I would like you uh, to forget, uh, especially, is that we keep talking about bits and qubits. This is quite a homocentric point of view. I mean, there's no reason why the universe should use bits to encode information just because we use it in our computers. There are many ways to encode information. And uh, I will try to argue together with you uh, that it, from the perspective of the universe, maybe tesseracts uh, are uh, much better suited for the purpose. And uh, from the definition of tesserats uh, as a physical information, the information that is physical, so connecting the mathematical part of information and some physical entity that we will introduce today, uh, I will show some um, uh, consequence that comes from that. In particular, that uh, you need a mechanism to conserve this information that really looks like a lot like a, a microscopic uh, mechanism of entanglement. And uh, I would even argue that this is the only thing we need to have uh, emerging physics. So it's really ambitious, but uh, yeah, this conference I really like because it's really provocative and uh, come, let's try to be the architect for just 20 minutes. So uh, the first question uh, I start to ask uh, is uh, myself is which kind of information? And uh, I then started with some properties. This is a short list. So uh, definitely it should, I should, I don't care about uh, who's looking at it. It should be somehow observer independent. That's the first property that I would like to have. And the second one is should be quantized and countable. We know all the problems that comes with analogic computation. Uh, and even if I'm very cool, I'm the architect of the universe, uh, still I modest enough to don't want to do computation with infinities. So I don't want infinities. The information should always be finite. And uh, finally, it should not change for no reason. So if I put it aside, 
uh, and it, it disappears or it changes uh, randomly, then it's not going to be so useful to compute anything. So these are, were the, let's say, the requirements. And uh, I realized that uh, starting from this, the, one of the few, if not the only uh, a physical entity can, that can encode these kind of things is phases in physics. But especially quantization of phases is something that we really miss. Uh, because actually in quantum mechanics, we already deal with phases. So it might not be surprising to many of you that the information is somehow related to phases. So the big step here is to try to think what if uh, the universe computes the physical reality with phases, but these phases are quantized then. And uh, to do that, we simply take the Gaussian integers, which is nothing less than complex numbers where the imag imaginary and real part are integers here represented by the red dots in the complex plane. And of course they have now four quanta, uh, which are i minus i, one minus one with the associated phases. And uh, once you think about that, uh, you, you have uh, not only four quanta, but you also see that you can only approximate a, a generic phase with infinite precision in the limit of infinite amount of information. So this gives you a kind of uh, sub-correspondence principle between uh, the two representation, the one that we are most used with uh, and this new perspective. Uh, but many of you might argue, okay, but now you have four units. Yeah, I could have taken two bits instead of one, nothing would have changed. But actually you have to be careful because by introducing this type of uh, units for encoding information, we are really changing the computational logic behind this encoding. In fact, tesserets are quanta of complex numbers and they are different than bits as complex numbers are different than real numbers. So if you prefer, you could think about tesserets are as the uh, kind of hybrid between the discreteness, uh, discretization of uh, bits. So the, really the countability of, of bits and the interference properties of qubits with the advantage that you don't need to measure or collapse the qubit to get any information out of it. So, and because this is a very multidisciplinary uh, conference, I would like to link uh, this comput computational uh, logic difference of tesserets with what you see in DNA, because actually tesserets are much from, from the computational point of view and the logical point of view are much similar to the way DNA stores information more than bits. Uh, and indeed, uh, as you can imagine, I call them tessera just to distinguish them from the bits. And uh, by linking out the DNA, I don't want to associate anything with DNA uh, in this, in the, in this uh, view. It's just a fun, interesting facts that may, uh, many of you might like. So, um, but what do we do with this quantized information? Now, uh, the great advantage is that we can start to think to build uh, ontological wave functions. So wave functions that are just built from building blocks, which can only be this quantum of information. So instead of exciting vacuum uh, with the particle excitation, we just uh, can write uh, a mapping. That's exactly what we are doing here, uh, where we have some vacuum modes and we have uh, a, a collection of quantized phases inside and we project them from a reciprocal space where information stays and is a non-local entity now to generate a four-dimensional scalar field in, in, the, in the real space, which is our ontological wave function. And it has many properties that I don't have time to uh, go into detail, but now you say, okay, we have states, we have a, a proposal for which kind of information we can use, but now there should be what, what's the law of physics. And uh, I still need to conserve this information. I think everybody would agree that within a quantum state, information should be conserved, at least within a quantum state that doesn't interact with anything. Uh, otherwise, yeah, we would not probably call it even a state. So there should be a mechanism in physics. There should be a physical law that is a phase lock mechanism between these quantum phases. Because if we have quantized phases, we put them in different modes and they all have their own natural frequency. Very, very soon, everything is a mess. So somehow, there must be a phase lock mechanism. And such a phase lock mechanism sounds a lot like entanglement actually, but from a microscopic perspective. And how in practice that can look like. So uh, I was uh, on a 20 by 20 meter island uh, in the Philippines when I came up with this uh, proposal. And uh, I don't know all the implication of this equation, but. Uh, we can discuss some of uh, the, uh, the properties it has. So first of all, 
uh, you can recognize uh, some kind of expectation value of uh, energy and here you have some momentum and the speed of light and uh, everything first of all is built by the usual energy and momentum operator which are universal now. and you don't see any potential any mass anything that's exactly what we want we don't want to introduce these properties in our physical law they should be emerged and the only way I could find to make something emergent is to put together two, these two scalar fields, the, the, let's say the complex conjugate field and the other side. So at that point, you start to have cross products. You start to have a kind of, at least the way I understand it, a kind of interaction between these two fields, like if they would not exist alone. And once you do that, you can get emergent properties. And uh, you, somebody might understand it better saying, okay, now we have ontological states and we want to find out the energy because the energy gives the time evolution of such states, but now uh, they are all eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. So if we take a kind of expectation value, we have a way to determine this expectation value, then we know the way, the, the energy of that state. Um, but to understand even further what, what actually we wrote down there, uh, and this is really how I got there. Uh, I started from this one, and then I started to put a bomb type wave function where R is the amplitude of a wave function, S is the action, just to try to understand what, what does this mean. And actually, when you, once you do that, you, you can get the relativistic dispersion relation out of it with only one extra ingredient. You need to allow yourself to define the mass of the particle as an emerging property of the interaction between these two scalar fields. And it becomes kind of something on, on a gradient of, of the uh, wave function amplitude. So already it came out something that we expected that now we have that the mass is a property of, of uh, emerging property of, uh, from this equation. And not only the mass, but all the interactions, because what we wanted to do at the beginning is to find a kind of entanglement law that puts all these phases and phase lock together, entangle them uh, in a kind of self-organization mechanism that should only depend on, let's say, the information we throw inside our baby universe at time zero. So to, to look how this works, you can imagine this psi i is just the easiest thing you can have in this baby universe, is just one quantum of information inside a vacuum mode with its own natural frequency. And we want to know what, what is the effect of the environment, this psi big, uh, which is composed of many other quantum of information that will affect the way this, uh, the time evolution of this psi i. And of course, you can say, okay, if there is only psi i, what you get from here is just the natural frequency of, uh, of the vacuum mode of psi i. But as soon as you have others, you have all the cross products that give you a modification of this frequency due to the presence of the others. And not only that, because you have also the, um, it, this will be, the cross product will be different than zero only if you have some kind of overlap between the wave function in the real space of, of uh, so I don't want to, uh, of course, you can get the kind of Schrodinger-like evolution for this. You can get the Lagrangians, but uh, yeah, I think if you focus on just on this, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's the most uh, that you can bring home. And once I start to think uh, uh, from this perspective, I, I really, many things in quantum mechanics uh, were, were much clearer. Uh, what we actually did is to, to map uh, some discrete information in a reciprocal space to uh, a real space where we saw kind of a link between discrete and continuous we have now. We have uh, shown that there is a duality between the representation, which is actually the wave particle duality, but is now more like wave information duality between uh, these two spaces. And we can create uh, yeah wave function from, from pure information in that sense. And we also explicit, made explicit the non-locality of such information. Information does not have space. What we just said in this process is that we have information is projected into space with this projection uh, that, that we can uh, do. And once it's there, what the wave function doesn't tell you where information is, it tells where this information can be accessed from. 
So your overlap of the wave function tells you where you can exchange information between two states. And many other things uh, like uh, not having Schrodinger cats because uh, yes, you cannot just make uh, arbitrary uh, wave function. You solve the problem of having kind of hidden infinite uh, precise phases within wave functions and other things. But most importantly, because you can uh, have this kind of entanglement between this quantum of information, you can also think that all other uh, interactions are emergent. And in that way, we, it, it really seems that you don't need anything else to be able to have emergent properties, which include both particle properties and, and interaction. And finally, once you start thinking about what we know about physics in uh, all this perspective of quantized information, uh, you, you can also uh, try to think which new experiments you can do to prove this. And you find out that uh, there are a lot of interesting thoughts that you can have. And uh, I would just, I don't have time to go through that, but uh, one thing I want to mention is that when our detectors in the lab do not click, they still exchange information with our wave function. We can measure that. And with that, I will go back uh, uh, to uh, the key takeaways uh, that now hopefully are more familiar to you. And I would like to thank you very much for your attention and ask you that if any of this uh, really is of interest of you, please contact me because uh, I need some help also to develop this further and speed up this research. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's time for some questions. Yes, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, one question and one rant. The question is, have you considered massless states when you showed that equation, what happens if you put M0? Does it come out senseless or are there consequences? And the rant would be, if you observe that the universe has entered dark energy dominance since Z whatever, until today and continuing, can this be interpreted? Because we know that the universe is also evolving from less to more entropy, because the, if you consider the CMB to be not so rich in information, if somehow this process is responsible for storing away more and more of this information into dark energy, this would explain why the dark energy content is rising because you just store away potential information, entangling it, and it shows up as dark energy. That was the rant. Thanks. Thank you very much for, for your questions. So first of all, um, let me go back to here. Uh, your first question is about the mass. Can this be zero? In principle, there's, there are uh, situations where this can be zero. But I didn't explore. Uh, because as you can imagine, this is uh, more like to try to make the exercise and, and see as far as uh, how far we get and what we learn from this exercise uh, to, to think from this new perspective. And uh, I think we learned a lot. Uh, and but, but to really work out case by case, it, it's a huge amount of work to, to, to look out all the implication. And uh, I didn't have uh, time to, but this definitely can, can go to zero. So massless states can exist. Uh, and about the second one, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm not, not being an astrophysicist. I'm not the best one. So if an astrophysicist can reply that question in this perspective, it would be great. Other questions? I had a short question. I mean, yeah. here you talked also about, well, this looked like a free particle, but you talked about interactions. So you're meaning really also, well, interactions between particles. So how do you envisage that in this framework? Yeah, great question. I'm happy you asked because uh, indeed in this very short amount of time, it was very difficult to fit all the picture, uh, but maybe we can go back here. So when you have quantum states, you don't only need entanglement to conserve information within one quantum state, but also to distinguish what belongs to one quantum state or, or another. And uh, because you can only distinguish uh, by the, the in, in which quantum state this uh, quantum of information is entangled. So the exchange of information is really the progressive disentanglement from one state and the transfer of that quanta to the other state. And that's 
very similar to what we do in quantum field theory, like exchange of virtual and real particles. It's just that here is information that is entangling from one quantum state to the other. Okay, thank you. Thanks.